All praises to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And peace to everyone joining me on this program. This is the Found of Israel's Bible Studies program. And as always, it's an honor for me to stand before you on the Lord's Holy Sabbath day. Now, this particular lesson is about the prophesied Messiah, right? I just want to uh, get into this a little bit. Now, one of the reasons why I believe in the Bible, right, it's not just blind faith. One of the reasons I believe in the Bible is because of prophecy. That's one of the reasons why I can say it now. We've checked the veracity of the Bible. Okay, when was it written? Who was it written by? You know, things like that. When it was compiled, where it come from? We, we can go through all through the history. Okay, we, we can do that. We can go through the history. We can look at archaeology. We can look at all that. Okay, it doesn't really matter. But my personal reason as to why I believe the Bible is because of prophecy. For example, the prophecy of uh, in Daniel when they're talking about the different kingdoms that will arise. And then we look at history and those kingdoms arise in succession. So I just think that is amazing. Now, the other thing we're going to focus on uh, is the prophecy or prophecies of the Messiah, the Mashiach. So I want to get into that. Right. I want to get into that and just really kind of dig deep into, you know, let the uh, Bible kind of explain itself. Let the Bible kind of show you, OK, this prophecy, this is where it's fulfilled. This, there's this prophecy. This is where it's been fulfilled because I want to strengthen your uh, faith. I want you to grow in your faith. But before we do, please check the description box below. Thank all you guys who have been donating uh, because now, you know, I got some little, I got a little bit more lighting. Hopefully it's a little brighter in here. Got some more uh, lighting in here and that could, that wouldn't have been possible really um, without you guys supporting. So I do appreciate you guys supporting. Also, let's get into that algorithm. Let's like, share, subscribe, you know, smash that notification bell and I'll do what I can on my part. Actually, one of the members out there, you know who you are, is um, give me some very, very helpful uh, tips on some things to kind of help you go know, get the get, get the numbers going and stuff like that. And again, it's not about it's not about, oh, well, let's just grow this five million dollar. I mean, five million, uh, you know, subscribers. It's not really about that. It's about if you look at the numbers I have now and then you look at the views something's not matching up right so is, is it is it in my meta, meta tags is it in uh my keywords uh the titles i mean i, I don't know what it is okay so thumbnails or wh whatever the case may be but some of you guys are really good at some of those things out there so hey um just reach out to me at uh, foi bible studies at inbox imbox dot com foi bible studies that's plural foi bible studies at inbox dot com so with that, we're going to go ahead and get into our lesson right now. At the outset, let me just let you know, one, I'll be reading for the King James. And two, I will not be able to get to every prophecy, right? We're just going to get to some of the prophecies and, you know, go a little, you know, back and forth. Some Old Testament, some New Testament, some Old Testament, some New Testament, right? But I'm sure there's going to be someone who says, hey, you forgot about this or you forgot about that. I'm telling I can't get to all of them, okay? Especially in my, um, I choose to have a, a niche in this particular, you know, uh, ministry in, in the faith where I try to keep it around an hour, right? I try to keep my lessons around an hour, compact with a lot, a lot, a lot of scriptures. You guys know that if anyone's been watching for a while. So I try to give a lot of scriptures and give it to you in a, you know, in, in about an hour. Now, are there some exceptions? Absolutely. And I'll let you guys know that. So there are some exceptions. Um, just like, you know, the lessons in, a, you know, Black History Month, right? I don't try to hold those to an hour. I try to give you guys as much information as possible. I'm, I'm not trying to hold that to an hour. For example, and some of the uh, some of the holy day lessons, not all of them, but some of the holy day lessons, they may not be an hour either, right? So it just really it just really depends. Okay. So um, thank you guys for hanging in there with me. Let's jump right into the lesson, right? So what we're gonna begin? We're gonna begin in Isaiah seven, Isaiah seven. Okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit about you know. The virgin birth let's look at that a little bit right so in isaiah 7 we got uh starting at 14 what it says it said therefore the lord himself shall give you a sign behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name emmanuel right so it's just talking about um talking about the uh, a prophecy of that right now some people who don't believe in a virgin birth they want to go over to the you know the next chapter and start saying well see this is where it was it taking place and this king did this and that i'm like okay so we're, we're i'm i'm not dealing with that right now okay i'm dealing with those who already you know who already believe in the messiah right um the other the other thing is just a debate right so i'm, I'm not really trying to do that right now 
Not that I have issues with a debate, but now is not the time, all right? Matthew 1, let's go to Matthew 1. We see what it says in Isaiah 7. So let's go now to Matthew 1. 1, and I'm gonna start at 18. In 18, it says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, they were not intimate yet. Before they came together, very important, before they came together, physically she was found with a child of the holy ghost which makes it a miracle how is it a miracle that joseph gets with mary coitus has a child where's the miracle isn't that what we do all the time right so uh and it says uh spouse of joseph was found with a child of the holy ghost i mean the holy ghost you know basically brought it and you know made her pregnant okay um then joseph her husband being a just man so this is a just just man okay being a just man and not willing to make her a public example was minded to put her away privately okay so this is a virgin birth so if joseph being just slept with his spouse his fiance then putting her way would be wrong and then he wouldn't be just correct okay so let's just keep that in mind because some people they just they insist they just don't really believe in this whole virgin birth and that we can break that i could do a whole lesson and break that down he said but while he thought on these things okay behold the angel of the lord appeared unto him in a dream saying joseph thou son of david fear not to take unto thee mary thy wife for that which is conceived in her is of the holy ghost okay and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua, or Jesus in the King James, right? For he shall save his people from their sins. Ah, oh, he's going to save them from their sins. He's not going to save them from Torah? Is he going to, he's, is he going to save them from the law? I thought, okay, that, that's, that's a quick aside. That's a quick aside. Okay, so he's going to save them for their sins. Now, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. It's just the meaning of the, you know, the word Emmanuel. And at that time, Yeshua, once he's born, he's with us, right? Okay, so. Uh, let's see, God is with us. Then Joseph being raised from sleep, so he woke up, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. Okay, so he kept her and knew her not till, and this little phrase, knew her not, or knew them, knew her, stuff like that. This, in this case, knew her not mean he did not sleep with her. That literally means that. We can go into different places in the Bible where it says, and knew her not, it mean they did not sleep together. Okay, that's, that's what that means. Okay, literally what it means. But you're going to have people who are going to come in and try to twist it. Okay, so it says, And Joseph, being raised out of his sleep, and did as the angel had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus or Yeshua. Okay, so now the first prophecy we see, okay now even even the writers of the new testament in this particular case what is this matthew this is what matthew got for me this is what matthew got okay from isaiah 7. he's saying okay this this is fulfillment of that prophecy so it's not what i think it's not what you think it is what i mean the one of the the taught ones one of the disciples this is what he thought this is this, this you see what I'm saying? So it's not me. It's not you or I making anything up or, you know, or just or just kind of blind faith or it's, no, we're, we're like, OK, that's what it says. And I don't have to lean on my own understanding. I can just go with what Matthew thought. Matthew's writing. And he's saying that this is the fulfillment of Isaiah 7. OK, so that's what he's saying. You know, now, obviously he won't say Isaiah 7 because they didn't have chapter and verses back then. But you get my point. Right. So let's talk about where it's coming from Judah. Right. Genesis 49 and 10, another prophecy, right? So we're going to look at this from Judah, okay? And I'm going to go to 49, as I stated, and verse 10. Now, verse 10, it says, The scepter, the scepter 
shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Okay, so we have that as part of, you know, the prophecy. But I'm going to add another one. Okay, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to add another one. And that's Jeremiah 23, right? I want to add one more for you. Now, Jeremiah 23, I'm going to give you verse 5. Verse 5 says this, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and the king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Okay? So we have, we have that. Okay? He's going to do that. Okay? Someone that's coming out of the line of Judah is what we're talking about. Right? So, then, then you have some who believe that, you know, that the Messiah is David, right? But this scripture kind of destroys that because it's, he's going to raise unto David. I'm going to bring, I'm going to cut, it's going to come out of your line, David. Okay, is what he's basically saying. Uh, basically what he's saying. Revelation or Hazan 5 and 5. Revelation 5, okay? Revelation 5. So, Revelation 5, 5. So, let's look at a little bit of this, Okay. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the line of the tribe of Ju the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, so he's gonna come from David, the root of David, has prevailed to open a book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So look at what it says in look at what it said in Genesis 49 and Jeremiah 23. That this ruler, this ruler is gonna come from Judah, okay? It's gonna come from the line of Judah, right? So the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor log him from between his feet until Shiloh come, okay? And Shiloh, okay, we're talking about the Messiah. And unto him shall the gathering of people be, right? And then you go back to Jeremiah 23 and five, behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, coming from him, and a king shall reign and prosper and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. So again, in Revelation, Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. So he coming to open the book. What about Bethlehem? Okay. What about Beth Bethlehem? We're going to get that out of uh, Micah. Okay. So again, all I want to do is just lay out. Okay. Just lay out some of these things for you. Lay out some of the prophecies of the Messiah and lay out some of the fulfillment. Right. Again. As I said before, I'll say again, just to strengthen your faith, right? So we're going to go to Micah 5, okay? So let's go to Micah 5 and verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth hath been from of old, from everlasting. So someone who comes from everlasting, right? He really doesn't have a beginning days. He's always with the Father, right? So now, to kind of follow it up, we're going to go ahead and go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. So let's take a look at this, guys. And we're going to begin in verse 1. One Matthew two verse one. Okay, so Matthew two and one it says, "Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there were, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is it that he is born king of the Jews? Oh, see, king of the Jews, got it. For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Okay." When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Like, where is this dude, right? And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judah, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel, All right? Look at the interpretation. Now, is that something that, this, am I making that up? Am I inferring or this is exactly what it is saying, right? The connection is right there, right? It is right there. So this is what, again, Matthew is what, is how he, this is how he's interpreting uh, the prophecies. He's just bringing it forth. And that's another thing. 
What we have to understand is when it comes to the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, when it comes to the New Testament, you're talking about the entering of the Messianic age, right? So this is something that they were looking forward to, right? So coming from out of the Old Testament, after these 400 silent years, okay, they're looking at the scriptures and they see, they see that there's a prophecy of a Messiah coming, right? They've always had an Old Testament, they always had certain messiahs, right? All the deliverers of Israel were type, types of messiah, right? But we're talking about an ultimate one, right? We're talking about an ultimate one. The old ones never saved them from their sins. The old ones, the old ones never did that. The old ones never purged them of their sins and took on their sins unto themselves and stuff like that, right? So this is a different kind of messiah. This is a very special type of messiah. So they always thought a messiah was coming, right? And they're calculating like from, you know, building the walls of Jerusalem and all that way back centuries and centuries before they calculate and they're saying, OK, this guy should come around the first century. And so that's why you got three wise men who, according to their calculations, like he should be born sometime somewhere around here. We heard about it. We seen his star and all that other stuff. Right. So now they're coming up. OK, so these guys believed and followed the prophecies. OK, so that's the thing that we have to understand. This is how they looked at things. We got to get I put ourselves in their place, in their shoes. This is how they looked at it. OK, so. So according to them, it was time for Messiah to show up. So again, and when they taught, OK, in the Old Testament, all they had was uh, sc scrolls in the first century. That's all they had. They didn't have they had any New Testament or nothing like that. They didn't have any of that. They talk from old. So even when we're, again, entering into the Messianic age, they're convincing them, as Paul would say, you know, they're kind of convinced them and showing them that, hey, Christ, you know, Yeshua, that he's the guy. He, he's the one. Which is how this is how you got Messianics. Right. This is, this is how you got in the first century. They're trying to say, hey, look, these prophecies, it's this guy. It's, it's, it's what they're trying to convince him. Right. And they're and they're convincing him with. The Tanakh. They're, with, they're convincing them with the Tanakh. That's what they're doing. Okay? And so they're getting them to believe in the Messiah. This, this, this is what our prophets have been telling us <laughs> since the beginning. Right? Since, this is what our prophets have been telling us since the beginning. We read one, you know, in Genesis. They've been telling us from the beginning that, that, that there's a particular Messiah is coming. And so you have the disciples who was converted directly. And then you have Paul who's converted indirectly. OK, but all of them trying to convince him, OK, this guy whom you crucified, this one, he, he's the one. OK, he is the one. And we'll see how that bears out. Right. So let's look at Jeremiah 31, right? 31 and 15. Jeremiah 31 and 15. Thus said the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. And Rahel weeping for her children refused to be comfort for her children because they were not because they were dead. Right. So let's look at it again. Let's look at it again. Matthew two, Matthew two again. So we just read a prophecy. OK. And now we're going to look at what 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 did Hera try to do? Right. So we're going to start at verse 16, Matthew 2, 16, which reads, Then Hera, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all and in all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by what? Jeremiah, the prophet, saying what? Saying what? In Ramah. Was there a voice heard, lamentations and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Because Hera was trying to slaughter up just to make sure he got the right one. He slaughtered up all the children, the boys in particular, from two years old and younger. Just so he can make sure this king, this Messiah you guys are looking for, you know, really this king because, he, you know, Hera was the king and he didn't want to be overthrown by some child, right? So he's trying to get, get rid of them. That's why you have these scriptures that says, you know, who can claim his generation, right? Because in his generation, okay, two years and down, they are all kids. They're all slaughtered, okay, in that area of the earth, right? They're all slaughtered. He was getting, Harrow was getting rid of all of them, okay? So let's look at 
uh, his anointing, right? Let's look at his anointing, all right? They, so, because we, we have to realize it, anointed by the Spirit, right? But even that was prophesied. So if we go to Isaiah 11, okay? Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 11, let's look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, And the Spirit of, of, of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, right? So we can definitely say if we look at uh, the Messiah in his totality, right? We know that all this was within him, right? We know that he had a passion, uh, he had a knowledge, he had might, he had all that, right? So Matthew 3, okay? Matthew 3, start at verse 16, if you will. And Jesus, when he was baptized, okay? went up straightway out of the water and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lighted upon him and lo a voice from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased okay so we're looking at yeshua getting baptized and then the spirit rested upon him okay so when we look at isaiah 11 that's really just it's just telling you the, the what type of spirit was uh left up upon him that rested upon him okay it was the spirit of the most high yah right but those things contained in that is wisdom and understanding and the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the lord all those things are contained okay in there and of course we can go to different places and show where <laughs> where yeshua hamashiach demonstrated those things right in fact, that's your homework assignment, okay? So you go check those things out. All right, does, uh, so we're going to look at the zeal of God, right? Okay, so there's going to be uh, a prophecy here over in Psalm, okay, of Tehillim, Psalm 69, okay? Psalm 69, and I'm going to read verse 9. Psalm 69 and verse 9, which reads, For the zeal of thine house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproaches thee are falling upon me, right? So he said, you know what? We'll just look at, we'll just look at some of the uh, translations from that, okay? So let's look at this. John 2, uh, Yochanan 2, right? Let's look at John 2. And I'm going to begin at verse 15. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, right? He drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the table. So it sounds like Yeshua was pretty upset, right? Is this not a zeal of God? Is this not a zeal? Having a zeal for the most high? Having a zeal for the father, right? Is this, is this, is this not a demonstration, right? Okay, and said unto them that so does. Take these things hence, like get this out of here. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise where you just sell stuff, make money and stuff like that, right? Selling indulgences, right? And trying to profit. And his disciple remember that it was written, the zeal of thy house has eaten me up and consumed him, got him mad. He got upset, he was triggered. He was triggered, he was upset. Okay, as they say, it's, it was, <laughs> and it was, it was up and it stayed up, okay? He was like, get, Get all of this out of my father's house. You're not going to turn this into just you know, a store, basically. Okay, a store. Just selling the doves and selling all because, you know, they have to offer offerings for their sins and stuff like that. So let's just come on up to the temple and let's just, you know, hey, uh, did you? Okay, did you, 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 you probably sinned this week. Come on, step right up, step right up. Probably became carnival barkers or something, right? I'm not saying I'm just... I'm just saying, right? I'm not saying that's exactly what it was, but that was the problem. And he had a zeal, making some cords and just start whipping. Now remember, you gotta remember, Yeshua being a grown man, grabbing cords and stuff, and swinging and whipping other grown men. Seem a little passionate, right? Had a zeal of Yah. I tried it today, it may not go so well. Okay? Had a zeal of Yah, right? So. Let's go ahead and go to a passage where we're talking about a messenger is going to come forth, right? A messenger is going to come forth, right? So we're going to go to Isaiah 40, Isaiah 40 in verse 3, Isaiah 40 in verse 3. And it reads this way. The voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Ooh. Voice in the wilderness. Interesting. 
You guys already know where I'm going, but we're going to go there anyway, which is Matthew chapter 3. Matthew, Matthew chapter 3, first three verses, right? Voice in the wilderness. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the what? Wilderness of Judea. Huh. Okay. And talking about preparing the way. Okay. And it says, and saying, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hmm. Now watch this. The interpretation thereof says this. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make it path straight. Get out of his way, make way, make way. Not my personal interpretation, right? Not my personal interpretation. It's just, this, this is what it is. So brothers and sisters, I'm just giving you like, there's many reasons I believe in the Bible. This is just like number one, okay? This, this is just number one, prophecy that is. Not, not this particular couple of verses, but prophecy overall. This is what I believe, okay? The mathematical chances that one man can fulfill these prophecies. That can fulfill one, two, three of them. Notice I didn't even pick, pick a high number. The mathematical improbabilities for man to be able to, conf to, to fulfill these prophecies is astounding. It is zero point, a lot of zeros after that chance of a man being able to fulfill two or three of them. Two or three of them. Try controlling when you're born. I digress. Let's keep it going, guys. Let's keep it going. We're going to go Isaiah. Okay. 35. Okay, Isaiah 35. So Isaiah 35, five and six, it says this. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Hmm. Then shall the lame man leap as a harp and the tongue of the dung sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert. So he's just talking about something's gonna happen. A, power, a very powerful being is going to be able to perform miracles right because we need a sign we we got to know how do we know if we follow in the right one right so he was just saying in the world all these things are going to happen right if somebody if someone is blind they'll be able to see again if someone's deaf they'll be able to hear again okay if somebody is lame they'll be able to walk again if someone is mute they will be able to speak again right stuff like that for for example so let's go on over to uh matthew 9 Okay, Matthew 9, and we're going to start at verse 35. Matthew 9 and verse 35. Let's see, where are we? And Jesus, or Yeshua, went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And what? Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. What, I mean, what, 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 what are we supposed to say? What are we supposed to do with that? Prophecy being fulfilled. We're reading about it. We're reading about it. Old, new. Old, new. Tanakh, Brit, Hadashah. Come on. Old Testament, New Testament. I mean, brothers and sisters, we need a reason to believe. I'm choosing prophecy. Okay, I, I, I'm choosing prophecy among other things, but I'm choosing prophecy. You can choose whatever you want, but I'm just saying we have a reason to believe. You have a reason for the hope that is within you. Right? So far, how are we doing, guys? If you're starting to get it, is it starting to sink in, please put a 100 uh, in the chat. Put a 100 in the chat. Let me know if you're starting to get it. Let me know if it's starting to kind of sink into you a little bit. Let me know, put a 100 in the chat if Yeshua sounds like this person is fulfilling these prophecies. 
Talk, talk to me, okay? Talk to me. Okay, so let's go on over to Isaiah 9. Okay, looking at more prophecy. Okay, more prophecy. Okay, we did Bethlehem, Judah, and let's just look at Galilee, uh, Galilee and all that. Let's, let's look at these things, right? So Isaiah 9, we're going to read the first two verses, which reads this way. Nevertheless, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation. When at first he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Natali, and afterwards did more grievously afflict her by the way of the sea. Beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the nations, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. Okay? So, Something special has come to the land of Galilee, okay? So we're going to look at it over in Matthew chapter 4. We're going to Old Testament, New Testament, right? So we're going to look at it from that perspective, okay? Matthew 4, okay? Let's look at it from uh, starting at 12. Now, when Jesus, or Yeshua, had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee and leaving Nazareth. He came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulon and Naphtali, right? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee, of the Gentiles, right? Of the nations. Gentiles mean nations. The people which sat in the darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region and sh uh, shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus, or Yeshua, began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That light showed up in Galilee. That light, that light showed up. That's basically what we're dealing with, right? That's basically what we're talking about. Brothers and sisters, I mean, what can I say? What can I say? Fulfilling left and right, we're not even done. And I, and I can't even get to, I won't even have time to get to every single prophecy about him, right? But I hope I'm giving you enough to, 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 to understand. I hope I'm giving you enough so that you can believe. I hope I'm giving you enough so that you can increase your faith. That's why I do lessons like this. I do them like this so that we can increase our faith. I mean, a lot of times my lessons are more academic in nature. But I can't do every lesson like that. I need to do some lessons that uh, speaks directly to your faith. I know the other lessons can do it as well, right? I know we can do it as well, but I want to connect directly to your faith. I want you to connect it as to why you are messianic. Why? Why are you messianic? Because logically you can think, how could one person fulfill, fulfill all these? Uh, how is that even possible? Matthew, even if you want to appeal to your logic, right? How is it even possible that one man can fulfill all these prophecies? How can it be manipulated or cajoled? How? Right? Because you can go outside the Bible, right? You can go outside the Bible and look at certain texts and things like that. Look at certain texts that, um, speaking of a person called Jesus, right? And I mean, we know his real name was Jesus, but... There's no other figure on earth have, that has caused so many pens to be put to paper. No. For a fictitious guy that never existed, right? What are the chances, brothers and sisters? What are the chances? Let's go. In Zechariah 9, we're going to talk about him coming in or riding in on a coat, right? So Zechariah 9 and 9, Zechariah 9 and 9, which says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt of the foal of an ass. Right? We even have fulfillment of that. We even have fulfillment of that. Now, that one I can... That one, I guess you could, I guess you could fake that one, okay? You read a prophecy, say, oh, okay, he's supposed to be riding there on a donkey. Okay, let me go get on a donkey. Okay, so I get it. But you can't do all of them like that. 
So let's look at it over here in Matthew 21 and 7. Matthew 21 and 7. And then you have to have the people follow. Okay, anyway. Matthew 21, 1 through 7. It says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem and were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus to disciples, right? So Yeshua sent two disciples, saying unto thee, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. Okay? And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord has need of them, and straightway he will send them, right? So he's telling them what's going to happen. You'll be fine. Somebody say something, you just tell them I need it, right? Um, all this was done that it might what be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee meek and sitting upon an ass and a, and a coat, the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Yeshua commanded them and brought the ass and the coat and put on them their clothes and they set him thereon. Hmm. It's right there. So right there. Don't know about you, but it's pretty amazing to me, right? All of it as a whole, collectively. These these prophecies collectively, right? Pretty amazing to me. And to know also prophecy of him being rejected. It's prophesied that he will be rejected. Isaiah twenty eight and sixteen. Isaiah 28, 16, which reads, Therefore, thus said the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Okay, don't waste your time. Okay, get on this. And before we even get to the, it being fulfilled, let's look at uh, Psalm or Tehillim 118. Okay, Psalm 28, I mean, Psalm 118 chapter, right? And then the verse is 22. It says, the stone which the builders refuse has become the headstone of the corner. This is the foundation of your faith. Foundation of your faith. And he's going to be rejected. And he has been rejected. And even to this day, he's still being rejected on, on some levels. Still being rejected, right? So let's see what 1 Peter chapter 2 has to say. 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to read 6 through 8. 1 Peter chapter 2, and it says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion the chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the Head of the corner. Same thing that's going on today, right? And a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed, right? So we already knew that was going to happen. And the same thing is happening. If you go and tell someone about Yeshua right now, and you tell them what he wants us to do, okay? Which is, of course, being obedient, right? Then they're going to look at you strange, right? Even though he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. They don't care about that. See, this is what's, this is what's um, a stumbling block to most of them. Meaning, meaning we're supposed to, to keep Torah, right? We're supposed to study the Tanakh and keep Torah and stuff like that, right? And people say, huh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Then someone comes along and says, well, you don't have to do that. That's old. Um, you know, we don't, it's, it's fine. Okay, we're under the new covenant. It's fine, right? And then you introduce them to the Yeshua that says, think not that I've come to destroy the law, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill. And then, of course, you continue reading and just say, you know, unless you, if you do it and you teach it, of course, you'd be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But those who don't do it, you know, uh, will be called least. And then you continue some more, one more verse. And he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Right? So you don't get the kingdom of Shemaim. But when you introduce this back to their mind, when you tell them, actually, he wants us to keep it. 
He actually wants us to be obedient. And now you see why he's a stumbling block. Wait a minute, he's supposed to free us from this law. No, he's supposed to free you from your sins. He's supposed to free you from the penalty of your sins. Now you see why he's a stumbling block? He's prophesied that he's going to be a stumbling block. The very one who's prophesied to come and save you is the very one who's going to be rejected by many. Let's keep it going, brothers and sisters. Okay? supposed to be a light unto the Gentiles. Isaiah 49 and 6. Light unto the nations. Light unto the Gentiles. Isaiah 49 and 6. And it says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribe of Jacob and to restore the preserve of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles or light to the nations that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Right. Till all this is over. So now let's take a look at it. We're going to go to uh, Acts 13. We're going to go to Acts 13, which says, Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing Ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Lo, we turn to the what? Nations. We turn to the Gentiles. Hmm. For so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. He's fulfilling the prophecy. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Again, prophecy being fulfilled, a lot of it, a lot of it being fulfilled right there in the first century. And this is their interpretation, not yours, not mine. This is this is what they believed. So we're going to go with that. We're going to go with what they believe, right? Even a betrayal. OK, even a betrayal. OK. Go to me with Psalm 41. Let's look at that. Okay. Even a betrayal. Psalm 41 verse 9 where it says, Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread and has lifted up his heel against me. Right. Stab me in the back. Betrayed me. Put his foot on my neck. Right. Dummy dirty. All right. So let's take a look at it. In John or Yokoran 13, right? John 13, I'm going to start at 18, which says, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me has lifted up his heel against me, right? Just kind of a idiom, right? Kind of an idiom. Lifted up his heel against me, you know, stab me in the back, right? Now, I tell you before it come that when it is come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Verily I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receive me, and he that receiveth me receive him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus, or Yeshua, answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, doest quickly. So he just said, well, hey, whatever it is you're, going, whatever it is you're about to do, just do what you got to do. Just do what you got to do. See, all this has to be fulfilled. A friend had to betray him because it's part of the prophecy. Period. 
and Satan enter into his, his influence. Satan entered into him and now Judas did what we already know he did, betray him. But it all had to be fulfilled. Okay? And then the other thing about the prophecy I wanted to kind of point out about these prophecies. Okay. Do you know how absolutely bonkers you have to be, like if someone wants to kind of fake this whole thing, right? How absolutely bonkers you would have to be to have these delusions of grandeur, because you have some today, okay? You have some, you have some fake messiahs, fake Jesuses, you got a bunch of them, right? But are they willing to do all these things, right? Are they willing to die for you, die for the people? Are they willing to try to, you know, I mean, are they, they, they gather some followers, but are they willing to die for these followers? Are they willing to sup with them? Are they willing to be with them? Are they willing to protect them? Can they or do they qualify for dying of sins? Do they qualify to forgive sins? Can they manifest miracles that you and I can verify, that we can see plainly? Because remember, a lot of miracles were performed and it did not matter what anyone believed and the miracles still happened. You see? That's the difference. The miracles still, still happen. Doesn't matter. <sighs> this is one of the reasons why I... <laughs> This is one of the reasons why I, I, I believe in Messiah. One of the many, many reasons why I am Messianic. Let's look, uh, let's get, look at the uh, pieces of silver, right? So Zechariah 11 and 12. Now watch this. We're going to kind of go back and forth a little bit, right? Zechariah 11 and 12, what does it say? Zechariah 11 and 12, it says, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Now watch this in Matthew 26. Matthew 26 and 14, it says, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests, and they said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. Basically, I'll, I'll point him out, right? And they coveted with him for what? 30 pieces of silver. Amazing. 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 So now, in order for you to fake this, you got to make sure you pick a friend that in the beginning, hey, I need you to betray me. And then you have to go to the people who hate you and say, hey, let's go all, all conspire together. OK. And when he come to you then you have to, you know, agree to the 30 pieces of silver. Hey, you you I mean, it's, you see how crazy it, it, it gets so the logistics of it is just absolutely ridiculous. It's, it's, it's astounding. Right. So just cannot be done. But let's go to Zechariah 11 and 13. Okay, so we got the 30 pieces of silver. Let's go to Zechariah 11 and 13. He says, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a good price that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Uh, let's look at Matthew 27. Matthew 27, 3 to 5. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw uh, that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, right? Saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. It's like, that's not our problem. What, what, they said, what, what do they have to do with me? So you go on about your business. We're good. Our, our business here is complete. Your services are no longer needed. Goodbye. Right? That's basically what they were saying, right? And he said, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. He's like, I, I can't even live with myself like this. Right? He's like, I, 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 I can't do this. Right? I, I, I cannot and I will not do this. Right? More, more prophecy. More prophecy. Let's look at uh, Zechariah 13 and 7. Okay, look at his friends being all scattered out, right? And 13 and 7 in Zechariah says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and again the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn my hand upon the little ones. 
Let's go to Mark 14. Mark 14, and we'll move around just a little bit. But it says what? And Jesus, O Yeshua, said unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered. Now, to see the fulfillment of it, we're going to look at verse 50, and it says, And they all forsook him and fled. They left. Gone. <laughs> Excuse me. And he said this was going to happen <coughs> because you're associated with me and you're going to see what's going to happen to me. All you guys are going to run. Right. Who's got my back? Right. That's basically basically what he's what he's saying. Who's got my back? OK, who are my friends? Smite the shepherd because he was their leader and the sheep was scattered. And that's what happened, according to prophecy. Let's do a few more. Let's do a few more before we before we close out. Let's do a little bit more. So let's go on over to Psalm 35. Let's go to Psalm 35. We're going to leave, read 11 and 20. 11 says this, false witnesses did rise up and they laid to my charge things that I knew not. They, I'm innocent. I didn't do this. Right. So the psalmist is saying, you know, I didn't do this. Then we're going to read uh, 20. For they speak not peace, but they devise deceitful matters against them that are quiet in the land. 21. Yea, they opened their mouth wide against me and said, aha, aha, our eyes have seen it. They're just lying, right? Just lying. I should not bear false witness, right? Just lying. Okay. So Matthew 26, starting in verse 59. And now the chief priests and the elders are all, and all the council sought false witness against Jesus or Yeshua to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. And the last came two false witnesses and said, this fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. So, of course, we know they're misinterpreting what he said because he was talking, speaking of himself and his body, but False witness, nonetheless. False witness, nonetheless. Because they knew that they knew what they were after, so it didn't even matter the intention, right? It didn't even matter a wrong interpretation because for them to be false witness and to be deceitful and stuff like that, they really did. They maybe they did kind of know what he was talking about, but then wanted to give these uh, chief priests and stuff what they wanted, which is a reason to kill them. So there you go, right? There should not bear false witness. So we'll go from there. Let's go ahead and read a little bit more. Didn't say anything. Didn't say anything to his accusers, right? False witness, okay? Isaiah 53 and 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened out his mouth. Now, someone who, of course, they don't believe in the Messiah, stuff like that. They were like, oh, no, he said plenty of things. He was talking or whatever. He's talking about against him being accused. This man did this. This man did that. He didn't say anything. OK. Talking about him being accused. OK. And it wasn't like he's going to be silent forever. It's just for a period of time. He wasn't going to say anything. Okay, that's it. That's, that's, that's all it means. Okay, something was happening to him. He said before brought, uh, brought as a lamb to the slaughter, right? He's afflicted, opened out his mouth, you know, as a sheep before the shearers is dumb. So he opened out his mouth. So at the time that he was about to get sheared, he's about to get fleeced. He didn't say anything. Okay, at least for a period of time. Matthew 27 and 12. Matthew 27 and 12, it says what? And when he was accused of the chief priests and the elders, he answered nothing. At the time he was being accused, we had we have a, a you know a Messiah hater, okay, which is literally anti Christ, go against uh, Christ. Uh, had a Messiah hater. I was listening to a debate, and of course they were just trying to disprove Christ. Like don't want to you know just want to disprove Christ. It's like oh no, see we can see plenty of places where he talked. They, Messiah's not a mute. <laughs> it's just at the time they were accusing him. Of some things he did not do, he didn't say anything. I mean, 
You know, some people, um, I, I can tell you right now, brothers and sisters, some people deliberately try to be obtuse. You, this is easy, easy to understand, yes? I mean, give, I mean, give me a break. Come on. Okay, come on. And we've got to keep reading, okay? He said nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor marveled greatly. He didn't say anything. Hey, didn't say anything. He's like, why? Because one, he's innocent, but two, Messiah, and prophecy had to be fulfilled. So while he was getting sheared, he said nothing. While he was being accused, he said nothing. Doesn't mean he never spoke ever. Okay, so, I mean, come on. Come on, brothers and sisters. Come on. Okay, so, we can, uh, we're can we going to look at a little bit of uh, Isaiah 53, right? We're going to look at a little bit of that. Okay, we're going to start winding this down. Okay, Isaiah 53. I'm going to read four. Start at four, four through six. And it says, what surely he has, uh, he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet... We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, and he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way, right? Establishing our own righteousness. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, right? I don't know any, anybody today that's going to do that, right? If, if, if he's not the Messiah and he hadn't come yet and all that other stuff, then who, who's going to do this? Who's going to do it, right? Then 1 Peter 2, 1 Peter 2, okay? Starting at 21. 1 Peter 2, starting at 21, which says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled and reviled, not again, and when he suffered and he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judged righteously. Who, his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Back to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Brothers and sisters, look. Um, just like I said, I, I, I have a lot, okay? He was beaten, spit on. We see that in the Old Testament. We can see the fulfillment of that. He was mocked, all right? Jeered, deride, chided. It's talk about when he was uh, crucified between, you know, two thieves. I can go into that kind of stuff. Uh, when he was prophesied that he was going to be rejected of his own, I can go into all of that, okay? Uh, the fact that he was going to be hated without a cause, I can go into all of that, okay? Even the prophesied that his, that his garments were going to be uh, parted and sold and all that, we can go into all that see again i only bring this up just to let you know that there's so many other scriptures right so so many other areas i just want to give you a little bit just so you can understand uh you know what we're dealing with you're dealing with the real deal brothers and sisters let me let, let me encourage you you're dealing with the real deal messiah yeshua hamashiach the only begotten son of El, the father the most high the one who's going to come and judge and make war. The one who's the advocate next to the Father. The one who sits or stands at his right hand. <sighs> Brothers and sisters, hope this lesson has uh, strengthened your faith. I truly do. Because lessons like this, this strengthens my faith. And I hope it does the same for you. And if this has helped you in any way or have edified you in any way, please give me 100 down, down, down below. Okay? Give me a hallelujah down below. Check the description box. I hope somebody has been edified by this lesson. So until next time, search the scriptures. Improve all things. Shalom, Israel.